Elijah shows up and appears to Obadiah, the top advisor to the king on his way to have a top advisor's meeting. How are we going to handle the drought? How are we going to handle Elijah? How are we going to handle the media? How are we going to... Yeah, 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 yeah. That kind of a meeting. Point number one, I want to take a look at our text. Our lesson text. Our lesson text is important for you to get an understanding, so let's read it. I gave you five homiletical points. You can follow along as I, I take a look at this, starting with verse 7. We're looking at verses 7 and 8. And I say the sudden appearance of Elijah in Israel. Now, as Obadiah was on his way, behold, Elijah, and we know that previously, they've, they've been in the discussion how to divide the land up in verse 6 uh, and how we're gonna, how, how we going to stay ahead of it, how we're going to get our economy going again in this drought and how long is the drought going to last and where is Elijah and and yeah, 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 because Elijah said it would, the drought wouldn't be, wouldn't be over until he said so. So let's find him and get him to say so. Well, verse 7, now as, now as Obadiah was on his way, behold, Elijah met him. Say that word, behold, Elijah, that's my title. Below, be, behold, when he gets to Ahab, he's going to say, behold, Elijah's here. We don't have to look for him anymore. And he recognized him and fell on his face. You know what that is? That's, that's respect, obedience. There are two people in the nation Obadiah would bow his knee to. One is the king and one is the nation's prophet. And he held them. Listen, Obadiah held them both in equality in the plan of God. God has given me Ahab, whether I like it or not. He holds the position. Here's Elijah, whether I like it or not, he holds the position. And they are both from God. Obadiah is squared away on that. He, fall, he fell on his face and said, is this you, Elijah, my master? That's what he would have said to the king. He understands that both the king and the prophet of the nation of Israel hold equal power from God. They're both sent from God for the goodness of the nation. And he said to him, it is I. Elijah says to Obadiah, it is I. Go say to your master, see, the equal, see that? Say to your master, your Lord. Your master with a little, little L. Behold, Elijah's back. Elijah's here. Elijah's back in the land. So we have the sudden appearance. Verses 9 through 11, we're looking at the search, something we did not know apart from this passage. Verse 9, and he said, What sin have I committed that you are giving your servant, this is Obadiah, that you are giving your servant, Obadiah, into the hands of Ahab to put me to death. Go tell your master, oh, uh, Elijah's back in town, and he just had a, had a conversation with me. He met with me. Listen, when he tells Ahab that, Ahab's going to take it, that you have met with the enemy. You understand that? He doesn't see, Ahab doesn't see what I see, that he's a master and you're a master from God. You're the enemy. When I go back and say that I've just had a conference with the enemy, you will kill me. That's a tough position to hold for a while, isn't it? How would you like that job? Huh? If you get on the wrong side of your boss, he'd kill you, not, not get rid of you, not cut your pay, cut your throat. As the Lord, yeah, the only guy that would serve in a position like that is somebody God has sent. Now watch verse 10. 
Watch verse 10. As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my master, this is Obadiah, Obadiah talking, where my master has not sent to search for you, and when they said he is not here, he made that kingdom or nation swear that they would, that, that they could not find you. He held them accountable. I'll whack you if you don't. Think about that. They've hunted. They have hunted. They've searched, quote, high and low and can't find them. Every nation surrounding them, they have, they have put the notice out to them, I want this man dead or alive, and I'm going to hold you accountable if I find that he was there and you hit him. I will send a powerful force against you. And Ahab had a powerful military force, by the way. We'll see that later in warfare. And now, he continues, Obadiah, and now you are saying, go say to your master, behold, Elijah's here. <laughs> Verse 12 through 14 Listen to me, scared to death in life. There's no worse place for a Christian to be scared to death in life. And one of the things I'm going to teach you over verses, over chapters 18 and 19 is this principle. Listen, scared to death in life is a terrible place to be for a believer. And it's an unnecessary place to be, and you shouldn't be there. It will come about, verse 12, 13, 14, and it will come about when I leave you that the Spirit of the Lord will carry you where I do not know. See, he knows the Lord has hit him, and you can't find him. When the Lord hides you, you no, when the Lord hides you, nobody can find you. You know, hide and go seek. There's always one kid you can't find. Did you ever notice that? Were you one of those kids? Nobody could find you. It, it, it didn't get fun to play with these kids anymore because they just left you high and dry after a while. See, this guy understands some doctrinal truth, doesn't he? The Spirit of the Lord will carry you where I do not know. So when I come and tell Ahab and he cannot find you, he will kill me. Although your servant have feared the Lord from my youth. As much as I fear the Lord, I fear Ahab equally. He will kill me. He will cut my throat. Or ever how he's going to do it. Verse 13. See, th listen, this guy that didn't want to talk has talked a lot, hadn't he? The guy who didn't want to talk at all is talking a lot. And you know why? Because he's talking to somebody that's on the same page with him doctrinally. He's talking doctrine. Is he not talking doctrine? The Spirit of God will take you and hide you again. Now, I'm going to go tell him I've seen you. Because you tell me, I got to tell him, I got to tell him. When I tell him, and he can't find you. Has it not been told to my master what I did? Watch this. Has it not been told to my master what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord? that I hid a hundred prophets of the Lord by fifties in a cave. That's how we wound up with 7,000. These guys didn't just sit in caves. They were guerrilla warfare for the Lord. That hundred turned into 7,000. Think about that. I hid a hundred prophets of the Lord by fifties in a cave and provided them with bread and water. And 
And now you are saying, go say to your master, behold, Elijah's here. It will kill me. In other words, it's not going to take much already for him to push me off the cliff. Because I already have one strike against me. He won't give me another break. Verse 15, Elijah said, do you know that Elijah's only spoke twice in this whole passage? <laughs> this is really important because, you know, we preachers like to, we like talk. Especially if it's about our subject matter, like most people. You know, when somebody hits a topic you really love, you, you open up. Otherwise, you know, you can sleep and listen to other people talk. <laughs> Elijah's only spoke twice. You know who's carried the whole conversation? Obadiah. Obadiah's carried this whole conversation. Verse 15, Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies... That's a, that's a big deal. As the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. I will meet with him today with or without you. The Lord has said, meet with him today. I will meet with him today with or without you. And it came about <laughs> and it came about that's let me tell you it's always going to be that way in your life listen you might as well go ahead and put it down this is always going to be in your and it came about or it came to pass it's always going to be there if you think you're going to avoid this well I think I'll go hide myself nah, you can't hide yourself the Lord can hide you, but you can't hide yourself. For the first one to expose you would be him. And it came about, or it came to pass. It's, there's always a time when it hits the fan. When all this comes together, and it has to be dealt with. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab, Ahab said to him, Is this you, you troubler of Israel? You know who the troubler of Israel is? Ahab. To allow idolatry in the nation that God redeemed with the blood of his son. Prophetically. Mm. A special message, a special message to be delivered to King Ahab, which I introduced to you in 16 and 17. The conversation reveals a real threat to Obadiah's life. Did you see that? I mean, you know what he, you know, you know what he was worried about today when he met Elijah? Ahab would kill him. He was scared to death while living. That's the worst place in the world for a Christian to be, scared to death while living. I hope you understand that. He said it in verse 9, verse 12, and verse 14. He said that a lot in a short passage. Pay special attention to the important doctrinal point that would be part of our studies through 1 Kings 18 and 19. For it's going to affect both Obadiah and Elijah. Both of these two men are going to be forced outside their comfort zones to face and spiritually fix their greatest fears in order to walk worthy of their calling. And if you think you're going to get by with that, without this, you are really mistaken. 
This applies to every person sitting in my church and every person who is studying with me on the life of Elijah. This is going to come to roost and you might as well deal with it. Face and fix your fears. Face and fix your fears. Because they hinder, fear hinders your worthy walk of your calling. Point number two. Hey, you know, I put, I just quoted Ephesians 4.1 on your paper. And you should read Philippians 1.29. You know what that says? Listen to me there. Look up here. Look up here. It has been granted. You know what that word in the Greek? That word granted, it doesn't tell you the story of the Greek word because the Greek word is where you get the word charis, the word grace. It is the grace of God that has allowed things to happen in your life. Positive. They're always positive. Never take a negative view of what God is doing in your life. Take a positive view. Romans 8.28 says take a positive view. You know what Philippians 1.29 says? It has been granted for you not only to believe but also to suffer for Christ's sake. Have you believed the gospel of Christ that he died for your sins? Was buried and raised from the dead the third day to give you life everlasting? Have you believed that? Do you believe that? Then guess what's next for you? Ne guess what's next? What's next? It has been granted by God's grace. Not only for you to be saved, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved. Not only logistical grace, that grace will take care of every need that you have, according to his riches. That you will grow by grace, you will also suffer by grace. You will die by grace, and you will pass into the next life by God's grace. Six stages of God's grace that you're familiar with. This is suffering grace. The word granted means God's grace for suffering. God's grace for you to believe. It's been granted. It's been granted by God's grace for you to believe and to suffer for Christ's sake. Not just to suffer, but to suffer for his sake. We call that undeserved suffering in the Christian life. And listen, is it, is it, has it been granted for you to go through it? Yes. You know why? Because you live in the devil's world, and this is a way to glorify God in the most magnificent way to other people who would not pay attention to God that touch your life, and they see you. And they see the grace of God ministering through your life, through suffering that's undeserved in your life. And it touches them in a special way. And a way of spiritual awakening. You do know that, don't you? You have no idea the suffering that you have gone through. And it could be in a lot of different areas. It's not always physical. It can be in a lot of different ways. But it's undeserved. It always touches people. It's a rippling effect that goes out from your life. It goes out from your life. And it goes, listen, it goes out a long ways for a long time. Please know that. You're going to be, you're, listen, if you're a believer, you're going to suffer because you live in the devil's world. John 16, 33, in the world is tribulation, but be of good courage. I've overcome the world. I will give you peace. Tribulation. Listen, the world gives you tribulation. God gives you peace in the midst of tribulation. I don't know. 
I'm just saying. Wouldn't it be good to understand this stuff? Take a lot of pressure off of you. Fear pressure. What's going to happen to me? Something good, right? Don't you need to tell somebody else suffering that? What's going to happen to you? I'm in the midst of suffering. What's going to happen to me? Something good. Is that right? Is that Romans 828 or not? Something good. Something good's going to come out of this. Something good. I tell my wife that every day of her life. I tell my wife, that's we start, that's how we start today and end a day. And we try to find something good. What is it today, baby, that we have found that's been good? And you know, <laughs> that's what you praise God for and thank Him for. That's the stuff you praise Him for. It makes you understand that the Lord carries the burden. He don't tell you to carry the burden. He's a, he's a burden-carrying Lord, 1 Peter. 1 Peter 5. Cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. He's a burden-carrying Lord. Listen, the burden is on you. You give it to the Lord, right? He gives it to you. You give it to the lot. The, the, God gives you suffering. You give the suffering back to the Lord. Cast your anxiety. Cast your care. What's going on, Lord? Something good. It's always something good. Put it in your heart. Put that in your heart. Please put that in your heart. Listen, you may not be going through it right now. Put it in your heart so that when it does, it'll go like, I'm looking for what's good. And, and listen, you'll find it. There's not a day if you look for it, you can't find it. And it gives you something worthy to praise him about and, and to feel like you're important. That whatever the conflict is in your life has not swallowed you up and it's not defeating you. You're using it to bring honor to the Father and to glorify the Lord, the Savior of your life. And you guys... Or gals, if you're, if you're in a, a coach position where you're ministering to that person, you've got to understand that. You could be caring for your father, your mother, your brother, your sister. You've got to know that. You've got to keep sharing it with them. You've got to keep sharing it with them so that you, you become a believer of it. <laughs> If no one else understands it, if no one else believes it, you do. And it carries you from day to day. It gives you excitement to look for the good in all of the mess. Because there's always a diamond in the rough. I hope I'm speaking to somebody, if not my, other than just myself. This is how I live. How I live. Point number two, while the word fear is never used in our text, the word fear is never used. In our lesson text, it's obvious that Obadiah is experiencing in his personal life, right? He never uses the word, but he expresses it. It sure doesn't take you long to realize, whoa. He talked about, he says it in verse 9, 12, and 14. I've only gave you, I've only gave you a few verses, and he's loaded up with it. I mean, it's the topic in his heart. It's carrying the conversation. So that's what fear does to you. It carries your day. The last person you want to carry, listen, you know what carries your life day to day to day to day? Listen to me. It's not fear, it's faith. 1 John 5, 4, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Fear comes from the world. Old man fear. New man fear comes from God. What Obadiah fears is based on a false assumption. Because it has not happened. What he's afraid of has not happened, has it? So his fear is based on a false assumption. 
Remember, a false assumption leads to a false expectation that leads to a false interpretation that leads to a false application. It's in his life. It will be in yours if you follow that system. We learn that from the book of Job. Thank you. Somebody listened. There are two sources for fear in a believer's life. One is Satan. We call it old man cosmos diabolicus thinking. And the other fear, fear comes from God. We call it new man divine viewpoint thinking. It's a positive. The devil's fear is negative and God's fear is positive. For example, Satan promotes fear, old man fear, worldly fear. Therefore, since children share, here's Hebrews 2.14. Since children share in flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus Christ, likewise also partook of the same flesh and blood, that through death he might render powerless him, the devil, who, has, who had the power of death, that is the devil. You say to me, Ron, do you have an example of that in the Bible? Yep. Yeah, really early too in the Bible. The fourth chapter of Genesis, which John quotes in 1 John 3.12. Cain murdered Abel because Abel, Satan, Satan promoted Cain to kill Abel because Abel was the messianic son. Thinking, well, that'll do God in. But we still had Eve, and Eve has a fertile womb. So God just gives her Seth, right? The devil always thinks he can beat God at any given point with some dummy. Well... 2 Corinthians 4, 3, and 4 would be good for you to read as well. How Satan tries to blind the minds of the unbelieving ones. But don't miss the point that Jesus Christ came and suffered death on the cross to render powerless the devil's fear over man. Did you get that? Ah, you didn't get it. I, how many times do I have to read this, William? Ten times. That's all right. You need to read it 10 times until you, get, until you learn that. The death of Christ on the cross rendered powerless the devil's hold of death over life. Because Christ gives us eternal life. Death has no power over it. Well, I, look, I can only teach it. I can, it's not, my job is not to make you believe anything. My job is to teach it. Now, God promotes new man, divine viewpoint thinking, fear, which is positive. For example, Psalms 111, verse 10. The first part of the verse says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's a positive. The fear that God has, the fear that God puts in your heart, leads you to positive th stuff. We call it a respectful reverence for God. A respectful reverence for God, fear. It's a positive in your life. It always leads you to something wonderful that God is trying to show you and clear up in your life. Here's one I love. I love this Psalms 23 4. I love this thing. I mean, God punches me on that thing all the time. And it's hardly a funeral I go to that I don't think I ought to preach at. Sometimes I don't because the Holy Spirit says no, but my heart wants to because I love this verse. Listen to what it says. I love the whole thing, but especially this verse. Even though, even though I want to, <laughs> even though I didn't choose this, even though I wish 
I didn't have this. I do. Even though. How about that? Even though. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Boy, that's up close and personal. You know, when you have the shadow, the substance is pretty close, isn't it? You turn the corner, there it is. When you have the shadow, the substance is pretty close. We call it, in the Old Testament, we call it shadow Christology. In the New Testament, we call it the coming of Christ in the first advent. Even though I didn't choose it. God chose it for me, and I accept it. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, uh, up and personal. Do you understand that? Up and personal. Watch this now. I fear no evil. Isn't that interesting? I fear no evil. Where would that come from? Old man Cosmo, most diabolicus. Satan promotes fear. But listen, Christ conquered it, rendered him powerless at the cross. Isn't it interesting? He said, he said I fear no evil. That's a negative. I fear no evil. You know why? Because he's walking with God. Who's walking with him through the valley of the shadow of death? The Lord. Is he ever going to leave him? Not one time. Is he going to walk him through it? Yes. No matter what happens. The father never leaves you nor forsakes you. Never, 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 never. I fear no evil. Wow. Then he goes on to say, for you, God, for you, Lord, are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I'm protected. You never walk alone. With worldly fear, you walk alone. And it holds you captive. And will twist the, it will squeeze the life right out of you. Not so with the fear of the Lord. Even though. <laughs> We're all going to have those, even those. They're going to come your way. Embrace it. Walk it out with the Lord. Don't let fear have one foothold in your life. Ephesians 4, 26, 27. Don't give the devil an opportunity, a foothold, a place. An influence. He can't, he can't indwell, but he can influence. He can't indwell, but he can influence. He did Peter. Quit. <laughs> huh? Matthew 16, 20, 21 through 23. Get behind me, Satan. What do you think that was? Point number three. Facing and spiritually fixing or replacing the old man fear with new man fear is important to progressing in your spiritual growth and in your walk worthy of the ministry calling he's got for you. Listen, some of you are going through suffering, undeserved suffering in some different categories. And it's a, it's a ministry calling to your life. It's a ministry calling to your life. You need to be aware of that. It's as much a calling as mine. Fear can be, listen, cosmic fear can be paralyzing. I've seen people paralyzed by it. Have you not? I'm talking about emotionally. Just absolutely emotionally paralyzed by fear.
the, in fact, it is so prevalent in psychology, th there's a, an entire study of it, phobias. A and it's so prevalent that you could make a very good living off from just that one thing, dealing with fear. And listen, it's the simple, it's the easiest fix in the whole wide world. I can't tell you how many people I've helped with phobias that are Christians. It's such an easy fix. If you got phobias, you ought to, you ought to come see me. Listen to Proverbs 3, 25, 26. Do not be afraid of sudden fear. And you know, you go to the doctor, you had this little <coughs> cough, and all of a sudden they give you, you got yanga ganga. And there's no cure for it. Here we are. We're in yanga ganga. And there's no cure for it. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? That's sudden fear. What are you going to do with it? Give it to the Lord, are you not? Are you not going to give it to the Lord? Give it to the Lord. Cast all your cares upon him because he cares about it. He cares for your cares. He cares for your cares. I mean, who else? There's nobody cares like he cares for your cares. Nobody's crawled on a cross and died for the sins of the humanity. My, my, my. Do not be afraid of sudden fear, nor of the onslaught, in other words, the threat, of the wicked when it comes, for the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. What would that be? That's 2 Timothy 2.26, the snare of the devil, held captive to do what? Do his will. I think I put that down there. Did I put down? Yeah, in fact, I wrote it out that they may come to their senses, escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Both Obadiah and Elijah will be forced. Don't let them, Lord, don't let them force you out. Just willingly salute them and move, right? Don't make them force you out to do something good for your life. But listen, both Obadiah and Elijah would be forced out of their comfort zones to face the reality of old man fears. Elijah has done really good up to now until Jezebel gets after him. I don't know. She must have been something. Both Obadiah and Elijah will be forced out of their comfort zones to face the reality of old man fear and to replace it with new man fear. The fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. Proverbs 29, 25. You know what's sad? Ahab will not follow these two guys' lead. Let me tell you, Obadiah and Elijah have been sent by God to keep positions in the nation to lead a spiritual awakening. They need one more guy, and that's the king. God has placed three guys in the nation to lead a spiritual revival. A, bring a spiritual awakening. The king, top advisor, Obadiah, and Elijah. And Ahab won't go along. He has secondary negative volition. Once again, Elijah is going to tell him, get rid of idolatry and return to God. Give God his rightful place in the priest nation of Israel. Listen to me. Let me speak to the church a moment. Let me speak to the church a moment. When you read the seven churches of Asia Minor in Revelation 2 and 3, he tells you a couple of things in there that's really important for us. All of those are local churches. They all have local names. They're all local churches. And you know what he tells them? He tells them, that if you want to go your own way and not go my way, I'll remove your church status. I'll check. Listen, I'll remove your church. Which is the light. 
within the community and from the community to the world. I'll remove it. I wrote these passages down for you to study somewhere. They're in Revelation, that second chapter. There's another thing he says in that Revelation when he's talking to the churches. I think it's in the chapter, chapter 2, like verse 5 or something, where he talks about the, the I'll remove your candlestick. But you know the other thing, he says it to every, listen to what he says to every church. Listen to this. He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit has said to the church. He who has an ear, let him hear. That's a strong statement. Point number four. The same directive will of God given to King Ahab three and a half years ago will be presented a second time by Elijah. He did it the first time in 17.1. Again, in the 18th chapter, he will begin this process in verse 1 when he meets with the king. Here's a doctrinal point. God and his word are immutable. Meaning they do not change with the proverbial weather. You need to know that. Hebrews 6.18, 13.8, and James 1.17. You know why? Listen to me. You need to understand that God is long-suffering. Long-suffering. With us. Think about that. For a positive end. That all would come to salvation. That none would perish positive end so it is with us what's our positive in it you're going through suffering what's your positive you got so what you got to that's good to focus on the directive will of god is presented what is presented is presented to positive volition and negative volition when god tells me to preach a sermon it doesn't matter whether i got positive volition or negative volition in the church doesn't matter i present it and then the Holy Spirit attaches either to it, either drives it either forward in positive volition or in negative volition. I don't, I don't I never think about it. I'm a positive guy, so I'm always going to try to push the positive. That's just who I am. But listen, when Elijah presents it to the king, is his job is not whether Elijah believes it, accepts it, or what he does with it. I'm just delivering the mail. I'm just telling you what God told me to tell you. What you do is between you and God. It is presented to those with positive volition who God desires to use in moving the plan of God forward in biblical history. In other words, part of a bigger picture. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is profitable for teaching, for reproof, correction, for training in righteousness, so that divine purpose, the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work or divine production. God desires to use the king, his top advisor Obadiah, and the prophet Elijah. To the priest nation of Israel to lead a spiritual awakening to their generation. He's got, God has all three pieces in place. And he's got two of the three ready to go. And now they make an appeal to Ahab. And we'll see how it goes. That's chapter 18 and 19. God desires the divine agency, which is the priest nation of Israel, which are 12 tribes, which have been split into 10 and 2, that still represent the priest nation. You know what a spiritual awakening would do in Israel at this point? Bring them back together. Like, they, like David did. Bring them into one unified mind for God. So what a spiritual awakening would do definitely would be a big positive. 
the divine agency, the priest nation of Israel, are to be good custodians of the word of God in evangelism. Today it is the church, the body of believers called the church of Jesus Christ, who are ambassadors. We are that today. And this virus, this virus is to bring a spiritual awakening, both individually and collectively in the church. The church is what's made America, America. It's written, the, the word of God is all over our constitution. That's why people are trying to get rid of it. The word of God is all over our constitution. We took a pagan nation and brought them to the, the promised land. A, a civilization of people who were pagans and heathens who were going to die and go to hell. And God brought the gospel through the Reformation, brought the gospel and the word of God to the shores of America. And the early settlers were faithful. It's our turn. This generation of the church has got to stand tall and be the light to the world. We have got to come out of this with a, a positive awakening, a spiritual awakening. 186 countries or more are waiting on America, which is waiting on the church of Jesus Christ. And we're sound asleep at the wheel and the world's under it. That's my opinion. I hope I am wrong. God's desires, God desires the church to be the light to the world, whether the nation appreciates it or hates it. And I gave you scripture. And boy, we better be faithful. We better be faithful or the church will be moved from America to someplace else. Church will, but the church of Jesus Christ will be moved from America to some other place in the world until the second coming of Christ. I'm afraid the church is asleep at the wheel and the world's under it. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, I pray today the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God to our souls. Behold, Elijah's back. That should be a good thing. But it isn't. Obadiah is scared to death. What will Ahab do? God has two of the three necessary for a spiritual awakening. What will happen? When Elijah, this very day, confronts Ahab, as we come back next week, we'll see. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens when you toy with God. It's not time for the church to shut down. It's time for the church to be open. To carry the message. Christ is alive. The church is alive. The fact that they call us not essentials. Father, just irritates me so bad I can't stand it. But maybe they're right. Maybe we've allowed ourselves to be non-essential non-essential as custodians of evangelism, non-essential as categorical truth taught to release men and women from the bondage of Satan. Encourage our hearts, Father. Give us a lead position in our own church. Encourage our hearts. People going through some really Tough, undeserved suffering. I want them to find the good in it. They got to look for it. The devil lies to them every day, lies to them every day, and the world lies to them every day, and they've got friends that lie to them every day, like the friends of Job, who came to him with their Bibles open and lied to him every day about his suffering. Is there no one? They can open their Bible and show the truth. 
Encourage our hearts, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.